Hi, Tatiana. How are you? Hello, Pastor David. Yeah, you doing well today? I'm doing fine. So we are so honored to have a friend of ours, Tatiana, come here and share her journey um, in life with us today on this podcast and tell us a little bit about what her childhood was like and a little bit about her journey today and all the blessings that God has uh, brought into her life and stuff like that. But before we do that, um, I like to always kind of just offer some prayer first, okay? Sure. So, Lord, Heavenly Father, we just uh, come to you right now, Lord. I just want to say thank you so much for touching uh, Tatiana's life, Lord, in such an amazing way. And we're blessed to have her here today and hear her journey um, and the ways that you have taken her through um, to get her to where she is today, God. And just bless her, watch over her and guide her. And just thank you so much for her uh, beautiful smile and her beautiful spirit that you have given her, God. So we ask you just to navigate this conversation today and just watch over us and guide us. We pray these things in your son's name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Cool. Yeah, so I'm so happy to have you here, Tatiana. This is awesome. I'm glad that you made time for us and everything. So. Give us a little little background. So where were you born? Okay, uh, I was born in Kharkov. It, now it's part of Ukraine, but at the time it was part of the Soviet Union. Mm. And uh, my family came to New York in 1980, and I got involved in politics, and I tried to finish Queens College, but it didn't work out. And then I started working for my godmother, Uta Hagen. Uh, she had an acting studio in Manhattan. So I'm more used to like being on headsets, I'm, I'm more useful being behind the scene, like if you know what I mean, than actually like giving interviews. And uh, I mean, I still I still can't believe that I'm doing what I'm doing because when I was growing up and we came here, uh, How I old started. Were you? I, I was sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. I celebrated my my sweet sixteen in New York. Mm. Uh, but the problem was that, I mean, we didn't realize it was a problem right away because everybody was like, oh, she came to like a different country. I mean, she doesn't know the language. You just leave her alone. She'll adjust. But the problem was that I started reading right away and I started reading like serious books, not just like romance novels, but I couldn't speak. Like all of a sudden, I can't speak. Like I'm in class, I'm in a regular class. Like I was the only person from my inner circle who didn't have to take English as a second language. And I ended up in a normal class, but instead of being happy, I felt miserable, I felt overwhelmed. Mm. And I would know the answer, and I would write the answer on onto the notebook, but I could not say it. I mean, it, it, it became so bad that I couldn't even come to like the lady in the school cafeteria who was like, you know, like making sandwiches and just ask her for a sandwich. So I would lie and, you know, like, like little baby genius is studying, like she cannot be bothered. I would ask my friend to go and get me a sandwich. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, there came a point when um, my grades plummeted and I ended up on probation, on academic probation, and a friend of mine who was uh, the head of uh, geology department, but he was also the head of the scholastic standards. Uh, he called me in and he's basically like, uh, what's wrong with you? Like you have the potential of being an A student. And he was the first person in my life to actually kind of hint that there could be some kind of trauma in my childhood mm -hmm. uh, because I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what. Like, let's say, like, I would have to go out on a date, and instead of feeling excited, maybe a little nervous, I would feel absolutely, totally terrified. Mm. And my grandma, and then I found out that she had a trauma of her own to deal with, and she would be like, she would be going to mom, like, just, just leave her alone, but she never, like, really talked to me to at least, like, try to explain what's going on, so I had no point of reference and I had no idea whatsoever what, what I was dealing with. So uh, back to Queens College, I started seeing this support group. Uh, everybody, like we came from different backgrounds. Uh, there was even like a friend of mine whose father was a police officer and she was like a victim of uh, sexual abuse. And as far as everybody was concerned, we were just uh, like a regular club. We would meet, meet once a week. Like at the student union, but instead of talking about, I don't know, birds or something, or music, we would be talking about our experiences. But at that time, I wasn't ready to deal with the fact that I was an alcoholic. I thought AA was a joke. 
and I was just basically going there for my friends. So I can, you know, like my friends were like extremely busy, even recovering from alcoholism. And the only way I could see them was to attend the meeting. So I, I pretended, yeah, yeah, I realized I'm an alcoholic, hmm. but I never really did because I can go, like if I'm not triggered, I can go without drinking for like a very, very long time. So, and plus, uh, when I really started drinking, when I started working for my godmom and we really started drinking, uh, we were drinking cocktails. Mm -hmm. And it's like extremely uh, convenient uh, to lie to yourself and to say, well, well, I can't be an alcoholic. I am just drinking cocktails. I'm not drinking vodka. I'm not drinking bourbon. I'm drinking cocktails. I'm a lady who's drinking cocktails with her godmother. And um, it took me a long time to actually realize that God was trying to tell me that I'm an alcoholic. Uh, a friend of mine, Bevin Love, uh, she works for Heart and Soul. She's the head of uh, Seeing Through Stigma. And uh, she came, I was, uh, I already lost the apartment and I was at um, Hawthorne House in Redwood City. And she came uh, with her presenters and that was the time when uh, the Warriors were going for the championship. And we were like, oh lady, come on, like, like just, just say whatever you have to say and just, just, just get out, we wanna watch the championship. And then she says something. Then Bevin says that her mother was her drinking partner. And I'm like, wait a minute. My godmother was my drinking partner. And I'm like, whoa, maybe you should forget about, like, like I know it was God speaking through me, like kind of like, just, just forget about the championship, just talk to this lady. And we started talking, and then I ended up working for her. I ended up doing presentations of my own, and I'm still doing the presentations of my own. Uh, but that's the way I realized that I had a serious problem. Mm. You see, the people who cannot drink for a long period of time, like I said, it's extremely, extremely easy to, to just say, well, I got everything under control. And then something happens and you just totally off the wagon, you're totally like So I have a question to ask. So you you kinda of talked about it in the very in the beginning of what you were saying. I just want to kinda of come back to it. And if you don't want to share it's okay, but so what trauma did you experience that brought you into the alcoholism? Uh, my grandfather. Okay. I mean my adoptive grandfather. Okay. Uh, my mother's uh, my mother's father. Okay. Uh, I don't have memories, but I have flashbacks. Okay. And those flashbacks totally ruined. There was uh, like something that was supposed to be the best day of my life when I was becoming Catholic. When, when I was going through, you know, like like the, the ceremony and everything. The catechism. Yeah. And a friend of mine who looked like my grandfather was in the audience because he was supposed to be my sponsor. And it turned down the lights, and everybody was supposed to light light, light the candle. And all of a sudden, I'm I'm, I'm having this horrible, horrible, horrible flashback. Sure, sure. And I'm like, okay, but it wasn't the first flashback, so I kind of was able to deal with it, and I was kind of able to, like, you know, like, not let my past ruin what was supposed to be the best, sure. one of the best days of my life. Sure. So now going forward, how many, how much sobriety do you have? Uh, four and a half years. Yay. That's so awesome. So, and um, are you going to meetings? Uh, not right now. Okay. Uh, but uh, I was going to be involved. You see, the problem is when you're homeless, it's like not having a foundation. Sure. And it's very hard to have any kind of stability because like you have a curfew like 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 uh my experience at uh maple street shelter was fantastic i mean it was the be like as ridiculous as it sounds it was the best time of my life mm. but you still have a curfew mm -hmm. so you can't like, like let's say unless you get special permission unless you get uh, like some of your brother figures to actually drive you there you can't go to eden or you can't go to uh, san mateo to um san mateo medical center or whatever mm -hmm. so you kind of limit it but we had the most wonderful thing about uh, Maple Street Shelter was that they were coming to us. We had AA meetings three times a day. Right. Uh, three times a day, uh, three times a week. Yes. 
uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday, if I'm not mistaken. And all you had to do was to be willing to meet them halfway. Mm-hmm. They would bring us books. I mean, you do, uh, they would bring us grape wine. You you didn't have to pay for like anything, like a- everything you wanted, like the big book, uh, what Bill said, like everything was ours. You, you just ask. That's awesome. So, how long were you at Maple Street? Uh, at least six months. Six months, and they helped you through life moves. Uh, helped you get housing. Well, not exactly. Uh, my wonderful case manager, Robert De Rossi, uh, <laughs> he finally he, he helped me like find an apartment. Yeah, we love Robert De Rossi. He's a good guy, huh? Um, so, and then how long have you been living in your apartment? Uh, a year, a year and something. I mean, I moved in last uh, was it March? Last March, I think. That's so awesome. I'm so happy for you. Are you are you enjoying it? Yeah, in a big way. I mean, like, first of all, I proved to myself that I can live alone. Yeah. Because when you live with your parents, when you come from Eastern Europe, you're kind of like like the Italians or the Mexicans, like the familia is everything. Mm -hmm. And, like, we never even thought about living separately. It just just wasn't in the cards. Sure. And then my parents got sick, and then it just, just wasn't an option, like, at all. Sure. And I was so terrified of uh, the prospect of living alone that I was just, no, no, I want to live with a roommate. I just want to make sure that it's not going to be a roommate from hell, but <laughs> I want to live with a roommate. Sure. And then Robert said, like, j- 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 just give it a try. And actually, it was a wonderful decision. Yeah. So do you have a roommate right now? No, no, oh, no, no, no you're not. Oh, no. It's a studio. It's a little tiny studio. It mm-hmm. looks like like a motel, basically. Mm. I mean, you have a kitchen, like a little kitchen, and you have, like, obviously, you have a bathroom, and like a little room, but but that's basically all I need. Cool. So, okay, so remind me, so how how did you meet my wife? Um, I think I just came to play bingo. Aha, bingo. Uh, like, all of my friends were coming, um, to street life man- ministries to play bingo and I love bingo. I was already playing bingo, like we were playing bingo at um, Redwood House. Uh, we were playing bingo at Heart and Soul, so I w- it's not like I, w- I was a novice at bingo. Mm. And here's this wonderful opportunity to play bingo. And then I met Sean, then I met you, yeah. and then I'm kind of hanging out with John Butler, who's a friend of yours. Yeah. And basically, just, just just kind of like you guys became my familia because uh, because the minute my parents died, it turned out that uh, my adoptive family had no use for me. Hmm. I'm sorry. It to happens. Hear. I'm sorry to hear that. Now, does your adoptive family live here in the Bay Area? No, no. Uh, they still live in New we York. We came. Mm-mm. Uh, we came like uh, to San Francisco proper in mm. 2002, uh, me, my mom, and uh, my daddy. Mm. Uh, grandma died in New York. She's buried in New York. She's buried in Long Island. Mm-hmm. And grandpa, uh, the one who was abusing me, he died before we came to New York, before we came to America. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry that you were abused. I'm really sorry that that happened to you. So, but you know, you have family here. Sean and I love you, and and I know Sean's very active in your life. Right, you talk quite a bit with Sean. She is. Now, did Sean tell you that we started bingo again? Yeah, she did. She actually okay. invited me last time, but I was going. We were gonna do, do an event, and I was going to get some paint, so I I, I didn't make it like like time wise. I, I was I was I was like hell bent on actually going there, but then I had to get something to eat. I just just wasn't was feeling so horrible, and I was like, I, I called up Sean. I'm like, I'm not making it. Oh, okay, so July third, we'll have our next bingo. So um, we have quite a few people who. Um, follow our, our podcast and our YouTube and stuff and, and they and we have a really amazing group of people that like to pray for the folks that, that do these interviews. Is there anything that you particularly would like for people to be praying for you? Well, yes. Uh, I would like to pray for healing because 
when my parents died, it's just like, I mean, I'm sure people who lost somebody very dear to them can identify like 100%. It's kind of like everything is empty. Mm. Like my birthday is coming up. My birthday is on Friday. I mean, it's coming Friday and it feels empty. Mm. I mean, okay. uh, as ironic as it sounds, when I was at the shelter, when I was with people all the time, you don't have the time to feel the pain. But when you're alone in your room, especially at night, it's kind of like... Okay. Any questions? If you want. I don't. It's not often I have my wife with me. So. Well, yeah. No, I mean, could you? Is it? Is it? Can you talk a little bit about living in the Soviet Union or in that? In that and okay. Just how you, what, what Are you means? sure you want me to? Yeah, she's good. You're gonna get into this. Mm. You can cut or whatever, but this is good. Okay. Uh, so basically, I want to say, and I know there's certain people in both parties who wouldn't, who hate the idea, but this is the truth. I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. That is the truth. Um, East Ukraine and West Ukraine were already separated even during the Soviet Union. Uh, in 1976, I believe, uh, my daddy and I uh, went to West Ukraine and it was like being in another country. Uh, it was not Russified at all. I mean, everybody was speaking Ukrainian. and. They were kind of looking down at us, like because they thought we were like you know like we didn't speak any Ukrainian because Kharkov was like heavily Russified, but for some reason they were kind of a little unreasonable even then. Instead of understanding that it wasn't our fault, they kind of like took it out on us. It was it was weird. It was like we were supposed to be in the Soviet Union, but our guide would would just say like you know don't go into that restaurant, don't talk to these people, and you kind of like like where am I? It's it, it's kind of like 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 the feeling like a lot of us have right now when they don't recognize America. Like like where am I? It it it, it, it was kind of like that. But at the same time. For the first time in my life, I saw those little shrines that, you know, the Catholics have like in their backyard to like, like uh, Virgin Mary. And I was kind of like, who is the beautiful lady? And that was, I mean, I didn't realize it at the time, but that was the time she actually claimed me as her own. And by the time we, like before uh, we went to America, before we went to New York, we stayed in Rome. Uh, because uh, they had to take care of the documents, they had to, ch you know, to check like who is basically coming. I mean, they don't want the wrong people to come. So we stayed in Rome and we went to hear the Pope speak. And the minute he opened his mouth, I was his. I was his. And now I understand that, like, she claimed me even, even before that. The minute I saw that, that little shrine, I was hers. Like 100%. Who's her? Uh, Virgin Mary. Okay. And so, 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 so it was totally different. Mm -hmm. Like if. So you had no Christianity. None whatsoever. Before, and so now all of a sudden you now all of a sudden you're being introduced to Christianity through the Catholic faith. Uh, my adoptive uh, family was Jewish. Mm -hmm. De jure, de facto, uh, granddaddy. Uh, was very religious. I don't know how you can be very religious and abuse people, but that's another story. Uh, he was very religious, but since it was dangerous, like you could actually get into like a lot of trouble, he would never teach me, or he would never teach mom. So I was playing, you know, those things that the Jews put on like when they pray. I was playing with them. I thought they were like cubes. I thought they were j just something to play with. Like I had no idea. And all of a sudden, I'm in a country where you can be anything you want. You can be Jewish, uh, you can be Catholic, you can be Muslim, you can be anything. Hmm. And it was, oh my God, it was such like a wonderful feeling that like you're free. Or you don't have to believe in God if you don't want to. I mean, it's up to you, it's entirely up to you. It was like, like something so new and so refreshing and so... I was, it, was, it was incredible. Hmm. I was like truly incredible. That's interesting. So, and then you were 16 when you came here. 
I was 16 and I finished high school mm -hmm. here. Um, I finished two classes in one year. So on one hand I was doing fine. I mean that's why everybody was so confused by uh, me failing at my classes in college because nobody expected that. Because mm -hmm. on one hand I was an overachiever, but on the other hand I was this person who obviously had a problem of some sort, but since I had no point of reference nobody could help me because I didn't even know like how to approach anybody. Like, yeah. I mean, like now I would be able to come up to Sean and to come up to my fe female friends like, oh, I had a flashback or I had this or I had that or I need help. But I didn't even know what the problem was. Yeah. It manifested itself is what it did. Yeah. We, we both, my wife and I both are in recovery. So I know, you know, you go, th you go through life to a certain extent, but then a lot of that stuff that you've kept inside starts to cripple you and that's what happened. Yeah. I mean, you got to understand that you... I'm never gonna reclaim certain parts and it's gonna be okay with you. Sure. Like I still don't have a boyfriend or a husband or whatever and I probably never will. But then again, I've reclaimed everything else. Yeah. Well, don't ever, don't ever say it never. No, you don't no, know. I'm not saying I'm not saying never. I have a friend, yeah. a very dear friend. She just got married and she's sixty years old. There you go. Yeah. How old was Ruth? Just gonna uh, so what's your relationship with um, with the Lord now? Mm. How would you describe it now? He is. Say, so, but you can start by saying Jesus or or the Lord, and because they're gonna uh, cut Jesus, my heart out. Jesus is my everything. I can't imagine my life without Him. He is always there for me. Like no matter how bad I feel, no matter how depressed I am, I feel His presence. I feel His friendship. I know he'll never betray me. Amen to that. And that's everything to me because a person who comes from the land of trauma, I mean, you know, he or she doesn't trust anybody for anything. Sure. Yeah, it's, it feels good to be able to trust, huh? Well, Tatiana, thank you so much Is for sharing with us. So, wait, hold on a second. Is, is there anything that you feel is important to talk about? Just maybe to wrap it up, is there anything that you feel like that, that you want to talk about? I just can, can I say something? Sure. Uh, I just want to say something real quick. Uh, guys, you got to understand that getting an apartment is only like maybe 25% of success. You got to be able to keep the apartment. Mm -hmm. You got to, like, you got to grow up. You can't, like, I mean, I was upper middle class and whatever I wanted, I got. And now that I'm living on my own and I'm on social security, you cannot do that. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be okay. Like your self-esteem, you cannot connect your self-esteem to what you can have and what you cannot have. Mm -hmm. Your self-esteem esteem has got to be with God. Amen. Amen. That's, that's really awesome. So basically what you're trying to tell people is that we have to trust in the Lord for everything. Yeah. And you've learned that, right? Yeah, and the more you lean on on the Lord, have you noticed how He's helped you through things? Oh yes, oh yes, it's incredible. It's it, it it's like totally incredible. Even me speaking, I mean, I'm like, oh my God, I feel like James Earl Jones. <laughs> I mean, I, it's like he would be able to identify like 100. percent Yeah. It's like I'm I'm talking, I'm doing presentation for for Bevin, I'm doing this for you, and it's a miracle. Like, uh, I remember we were like in New York, we were in this Russian restaurant. And you know, they do like the pictures, like they do this like eight by tens, this, this huge Polaroid eight by tens. And by the end of the uh, of the night, they already have the picture and you just pay for it and you just go on your way. And I was terrified of coming up to the photographer and asking him to have my picture taken. Mm -hmm. And mommy would be, oh my God, like she couldn't understand what was going on. She was so upset. I ruined the, the evening for her like totally because she couldn't understand why, like what, did I think he was gonna do with me? Like, like he was gonna kill me or something? But mm. I was absolutely, I was absolutely petrified. Yeah, Sean and I both believe that when we accept Jesus Christ and we and we live for Him daily, that He's an advocate for us and He takes everything that the enemy has stolen from us. Like the enemy stole you from being able to speak. When you when you were able to surrender that to God, the devil he took it away from the devil and he gave it back to you. And now look what he's doing. He's, you're speaking 
not only are you speaking, but you're 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 speaking for others. You're you're sharing this this story with others, and you know, be a lot of people that will hear this testimony that hopefully they're going to hear it and they're going to think to themselves, "Wow, you know what? I I need to give more power to God." So thank you so That's much for it. sharing. That's it. <laughs> See, it was pretty easy, huh? All right. Thank you, Tatiana, and happy birthday. Thank you. All right. Bye. <laughs>